Hi, good afternoon all, and welcome to the New York Foreign Press Center for the hybrid briefing on the 10th Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference. I would like to welcome our journalists who are attending in person, as well as those attending on Zoom. My name is Mahavis Siddiqui, and I'm the moderator. This briefing is on the record. First, I will go ahead and introduce our speaker. And after our speaker's remarks, we'll go ahead and move on to question and answer session. We're very pleased to welcome Ambassador Bonnie Jenkins, Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and Nuclear Nonproliferation and International Security. Ambassador Jenkins will discuss U.S. priorities for the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference, highlighting the treaty's enduring role in reducing global dangers, whether by facilitating arms control, safeguarding peaceful nuclear activities, or deterring violations. And with that, it is my great pleasure today to welcome Under Secretary Bonnie Jenkins. Thank you very much. And good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is good to see you all here today in person and virtually, especially since I understand this is the first open event here at the Foreign Press Club since COVID started. How are you all doing? Before we head into questions, I wanted to say a few words about why I'm here in New York this week. Today is the third day of the month-long NPT Review Conference, and I'm happy to say that we are off to a really good start. My team and I have met with delegations from many countries, exchanging our views and renewing our commitment to work together towards a successful outcome. Many delegations have told us that President Biden and Secretary Blinken's remarks have been well received and that it was great to see the United States leading again on these issues. If it wasn't clear before, it should be now. The United States is back, leading on arms control, nonproliferation, and disarmament, as is evident by the President's statement and the Secretary's and my presence here this week. While here, I am meeting with allies, partners, and others talking about how we can work together to make progress on these very important issues that affect us all. My colleague, Ambassador Adam Scheinman, the President's Special Representative to the NPT, will be here with his team throughout the REFCON, representing the administration and working hard to achieve a successful outcome. So thank you very much for joining me today. And with that, I hand it over to you again, Mavish. Thank you so much, Ambassador Jenkins, for your remarks. I will now go ahead and open the floor for questions. Uh, for the participants here, please raise your hand, and I will call on you, and we will go ahead and hand you the microphone. Uh, when you have the microphone in your hands, please go ahead and announce your name and your media outlet kindly. And uh, for the Zoom participants, if you have a question, please raise your virtual hand and wait for me to call on you. When you're called on, please enable your audio and your video, and please identify yourself by your full name and your outlet. You're also welcome to uh, type your question in the main chat room. So let's go ahead and open up for questions. Great, excellent. You first, sir. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jenkins. Thank you, Malvish. Uh, my name is Ahmed Fatki of ADN News. Uh, I'll start, get to the point uh, straight ahead. The uh, discrepancy, or not the discrepancy, the complementing between the NPT and the TPNW, which is, uh, as many countries, especially in the developing world, are citing that there, while there is a, a, a diligent work on the area of non-proliferation, there is hardly anything uh, on the area of disarmament. What is the U.S. position from the TPNW, and what is the U.S. planning uh, to re is the, is the U.S. I'm sorry is the U.S. planning to reduce its nuclear stockpile? Uh, whether unilaterally or uh, within a multilateral uh, frame. 90% of the nuclear warheads are between uh, the U.S. and Russia. Each uh, possess about 6,000 uh, nuclear uh, heads. What is uh, the, the, the actions that the Biden administration is taking in that direction? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Um, just want to start out by saying that 
uh, the U.S. has already destroyed about 88 percent of our nuclear stockpile. Um, and so I want to make sure that everyone understands that the U.S. remains committed to all of its obligations under the NPT, including Article 6. Um, and so we have already uh, in the past and working with uh, Russia, uh, destroying a lot of our nuclear stockpiles. So I just want to make sure that that's very clear. Um, and on the TPNW specifically, um, I just want to also say that we agree with the overall goal of the TPNW parties to uh, reduce and uh, ideas for disarmament. We agree with that. It's an obligation we have under the treaty. Uh, the concerns that we have have to do with the process of uh, uh, what's in the treaty, um, some of our concerns about the fact that we have to look at the environment, the security environment that exists as we talk about disarmament. So we have been disarming and we continue to be obligated to do so. We are living up to our obligation in the treaty. We share the goals of the NPT, of the TPNW parties about uh, reduction of nuclear weapons. But we just have some concerns about the treaty itself um, and also about not just about the, the concerns about looking at the security environment, but also some issues about the verification regime of it as well, which it doesn't really have one. So, um, but one of the things that we do want to do in the next four weeks is work with all parties to the NPT. We want to find ways in which we can work with everyone. We want to listen to what everyone has to say and find ways that we can have an agreed document at the end, uh, working through some of the things that we, some of the differences of opinions that we have with countries. We want to be very productive. Can I have a follow-up? Yes, please. Absolutely, go ahead. But you have to speak into the mic. <laughs> uh, what about the threshold countries? Uh, since now uh, Iran, according to the director of the IEA, is galloping towards uh, possessing a uh, nuclear uh, weapon. Uh, how, how does the Biden administration view the threshold countries uh, in this regard? Uh, well, the, the NPT, the TPNW is, uh, you know, applies to countries who are party to that. So I can't really speak specifically about Iran and the, and the TPNW. Um, what I can say is we, of course, are still very committed to the JCPOA um, and to the, 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 the implementing, having a JCPOA and being able to uh, find a diplomatic solution to the situation in terms of a JCPOA and working with all parties to the JCPOA. Um, but in terms of how Iran views the TPNW or, or another threshold state works with the TPNW, um, you know, I'm not quite sure. You know, so uh, they would have to speak to that because I can't really, I don't really, I can't really say anything about their perspectives on that or how they relate to TPNW. Sir, um, please go ahead and state your name and your media organization and ask your question. Ambassador, thanks for taking uh, part in this. Uh, Mike Wagenheim with I-24 News. I've got uh, two questions for you. Number one, you mentioned you wanted to see a successful outcome out of this review conference. If you can please define what you feel would be a successful outcome. And the second part of the question is, um, as negotiations are about to resume in Vienna on Thursday, the State Department, the Biden administration has said, innumerable times, we want to get Iran's nuclear program back in the box, but really can't offer a coherent definition as to what that means. Can you provide some clarity as to what putting the program back in the box means at this point in time? Thank you. So in terms of what a successful outcome, I think what we all would like to see is a consensus document. I think that if you ask most countries, and what we've been hearing uh, in statements that have been made by countries, is everyone seeks a consensus document. Um, but there's also a recognition that there are challenges right now in the NPT. And so one of the keys in the next four weeks is to find exactly how we can have that consensus document when we know that there are challenges. I think the most important thing is that countries come to the tables, in the next four weeks, ready to find ways to be pragmatic, um, to work uh, work uh, together to find ways that we can get to that successful outcome. So that is how we would define it. Um, however, I think what's also important is what happens in these four weeks. So of course, the final document is what gets the most light. But these are four weeks, which is an op provides an opportunity for country to talk to each other and uh, share ideas and thoughts about uh, their approaches, um, discuss where there are differences of opinion, 
um, hopefully people will, countries will come to the table ready to do that. So, you know, what is success? Success is um, a, a document that's, that's a consensus. Um, however, you know, we do want to find ways that we can work with countries uh, in the next uh, in the next few weeks, you know, there's joint statements that we can do, joint, other joint documents. So I really see that these four weeks are a way to really celebrate, reaffirm the NPT, um, 50 years anniversary. Um, look at the challenges, be honest about the challenges, be upfront about the challenges, and then find a way that we can work together um, to see how we go to the next the next 50 years. Um, as for what back in the box means, I. I would defer to uh, others like Rob Malley and others who are working on on the issue exactly exactly what that means. Um, you know, I, I understand the, the question uh, and and watching and seeing what's happening in terms of uh, the enrichment, but how we specifically define it, I would prefer to defer to to others on that. Thanks. Thanks. Now I'm going to go ahead and turn to our Zoom audience. Um, Alex Rafaulu, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself, uh, state your full name and your media organization, please, before asking the question. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Mawash, and thank you, Ambassador Jenkins, for briefing us today. This is Alex Rafaulu from Azerbaijan's Independent News Agency, Turan. The Secretary made it clear that Russia has been using Ukrainian power plant as a nuclear shield. So my question is about accountability. I, I realize that the review conference is not necessarily an enforcement mechanism, but I have to ask you, how can you hold Russia to account? Thank you so much. Um, I think what's important to understand in this situation is that this is a very fluid situation right now with, with the nuclear power plant, especially Zephyrisia. And the thing to really focus on is the fact that right now we don't have, the IEA does not have access to that site. Uh, there's concerns about safety and um, and also safeguards. Uh, uh, getting an understanding of what's happening at that site is really the most important thing. And that situation remains uh, right now. And so the real focus and the real question really should be, you know, how do we get access to that? Because that is, that is fundamental uh, to all of this, is making sure that we can understand what's going on at the site to make sure that there is safety and there is, uh, and there is safeguards uh, that we are actually implementing there. Go ahead, sir. Uh, please hand you the mic and please go ahead and state your name and your media organization before asking. Thank you. Um, my name is Yusuke Hirata, Sankei newspaper, Japan. And my question goes to the outcome document and the project nuclear power plant and the nuclear threat. Mm -hmm. uh, so are you going to seek uh, outcome documents uh, which criticize or mention or condemns uh, nuclear threats and uh, nuclear power plant attacks, uh, namely Russia. Uh, that, this is my question. Yeah, I think what's going to happen is um, for the next four weeks, you know, as I said, you know, an outcome document, a consistent outcome document is important. I think, you know, in the we will be clear about, um, you know, Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, uh, very clear about how their nuclear saber rattling is certainly um, creating problems in the NPT in terms of, you know, some of the overall goals that we're trying to achieve uh, with the NPT. Um, and then it, it will include discussions as well on nuclear power plants <clears throat> and the, the need to ensure the safety and security of nuclear power plants. So whether that will be in the final document, I can't say, because that's going to be negotiated in the next four weeks. But it's surely uh, in, 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 in everyone's uh, uh, attention span right now, particularly we're worried about the safety and the safeguards there. I'm going to go ahead and turn towards our Zoom audience. Uh, so AJ Park, uh, please go ahead and ask your question. Please unmute yourself and also state your media organization, please, and your name. Hi. Uh, thanks for Ambassador. Um, my name is Yihong Jo Park from Voice of America. My question today is about non-proliferation challenge around the Korean Peninsula. As you know, we have seen recently the developing nuclear program of North Korea, while the nuclear negotiation between Washington and Pyongyang is gone nowhere. In addition, we also seen what is happening at this moment around Taiwan with the increasing growing concern about increasing Chinese coercion in the region. So I think 
it leads South Korean people to worry about its nuclear deterrence more and more. For example, according to the latest poll, over 70% of South Korean population expressed their support for having its own nuclear power. And it suggests that South Korea is coming to kind of a realization that it needs its own deterrence. And also I heard that there is a fear that the U.S. is influenced by the argument that it will not trade the Los Angeles and San Francisco for Seoul in the case of the crisis. So, you know, some South Korean people even argue that, look, the AUKUS, Australia is supposed to have a nuclear power submarine. Why not for South Korea? Of course, the United States reaffirmed its commitment to providing South Korea with uh, extended deterrence. But, you know, I think that more and more people think that there is not enough in South Korea. So my question is, do you have any other way to address South Korean's growing concern about its, you know, deterrence, you know, other than reaffirming the U.S. nuclear umbrella? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I guess that I guess the issue is, I mean, I just want to say just, you know, the, the U.S. remains very committed to to deterrence and extended deterrence uh, for South Korea. So maybe I don't know if we need to say it in a different way, if we need to um, say it in a different form. But I just want to make sure you are aware and 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 your 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 colleagues and everyone. Uh, in South Korea is aware that we are seriously uh, you know, serious committed to extended deterrence. And that has not changed at all. Um, so I'm not sure, um, I mean, there may be other ways that we can reaffirm that um, to make sure that the South Korean, uh, South Koreans are, are confident that that is what we are doing. But we do want to reiterate that we are committed to our extended deterrence and to that commitment to South Korea. Um, and also want to mention that, as you probably know, you know, the administration has been very clear that we are open to talking to North Korea. Um, and basically anywhere, you know, any time that they want to engage with us to talk about these issues, we are ready to do so. And, and of course, working closely with you, uh, your government uh, and Japan as well, you know, in such a in such a in such an effort. Unfortunately, as you know, they have not come back to us ready to have any kind of discussions, but we remain open for that as well. Um, so, you know, we we are still committed to uh, South Korea for our deterrence. We are open to uh, to dialogue with North Korea uh, on the way forward, and we very closely want to work with our allies uh, in the region as well. Uh, on AUKUS, uh, what I will say is that that's a, a, a kind of a unique relationship right now that we have with Australia um, and the UK. Um, but to reaffirm for those who listen and are also concerned, um, the US and the UK and uh, Australia all remain very committed to our nonproliferation goals, our nonproliferation uh, obligations uh, under the NPT, as I know that South Korea and Japan is as well. Thank you. If you, if you don't mind, may I have a follow-up question? Please go ahead. Yeah. Um, so if so, what is the you know, Biden administration's stance on that, you know, some demand from South Korea regarding you know, redeployment of the tactical nuclear power in Korea? I think, I believe there was also discussion from, you know, also some sort of a demand regarding this from the, you know, uh, Japanese people. So what is the Biden administration's stance on that? You know, I'm going to have to defer that because I don't I don't feel like I have all the information I need to respond confidently to that question. So what I would like to do is get back to you on that. Thank you. Um, any questions on the floor? Please go ahead, ma'am. Please state your name and your media organization. Hi, I'm Kaori Yoshida from Nikkei, Japanese business newspaper. I wanted to ask, you mentioned briefly about the outcome document, but what specifically would you like to see in this outcome document? And also, um, previously, when we thought that this meeting was going to be held in January, the P5 had issued a joint statement. We have not seen a statement like that this time around. How do you um, plan to navigate the tensions growing within the P5? Um, well, we, well, there's for obvious reasons, there's no P5 statement, but there is a P3 ministerial statement 
um, that I would encourage you to, to, to reference. Um, so the, and there's other P3 documents that we have come out with. In terms of the P5, right now, for obvious reasons, we don't have a P5 dialogue um, because of what, you know, the, the situation of Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Um, so that's not uh, going forward. However, you know, the P5 exists, and hopefully one day uh, we were able to get back to that uh, when, you know, when Russia acts in good faith and does what, you know, we think it needs to happen uh, in, in terms of their, their invasion of Ukraine. Um, the, what was the second question? I'm sorry. What would you like, what would the U.S. like to see in the outcome document? Um, what, I, what I think we could say on, on that point at this moment, because we're at the very beginning stages of the four-week uh, process, what we would like to see is a, uh, a consistent document that really acknowledges the challenges that we're facing. Um, we don't want a document um, that we don't feel is going to be uh, reflective of current situations. Um, however, we will. It's, it's a process of negotiations, a process of the late nights and the you know the weekend work that um, uh, all of our colleagues and 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 folks are going to be doing here uh, to figure out what that document is going to look like. But as I said before, there's a number of challenges that we have to address, um, and we need to find a way that we can address those challenges and at the same time get a document that can be agreed to by everyone. Any, um, I know, sir, you had your hand up from second. Please go ahead and ask your question and please state your name and media organization again. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, uh, Ahmad Fathi, ATN, the news. Uh, with regard to the final document, uh, in 2015, there was no final document uh, adopted. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, the rumor was that it was because of the clause regarding the uh, WMD free zone in the Middle East. Is the U.S. willing to consider that, or that is a steadfast position that uh, the U.S. is not going to support it in favor of Israel, who is not a member to the uh, MPT treaty? Um, well, I don't want to get in front of what might end up in a final document, but what I what I will say is that you know we have been uh, working and with countries uh, in the region in terms of we know the interest and the concern and the desire for a Middle East weapons free zone, um, and we basically our position is we want countries in the region to be able to talk to each other and find a way that everyone can be involved in those conversations, um, and so we have asked that you know that process uh, move forward in that direction. Uh, we certainly hope that it is not an issue that will be a divisive one, that will create a, a situation where we will not have a consensus document. I mean, that among another, a number of other issues, as I mentioned. Um, so we recognize that that was uh, an issue in 2015, that was an issue that created some problems in terms of a final document. And that's why, you know, we need to work uh, from day one, or now day three, um, on language for the final document so that we can make sure that we address these challenges. And that's one of them that I've been talking about, the challenges that exist, um, that we could address those challenges. And of course, TPNW is another one that you raised, and we got to figure out how we address that as well. Great. I'm going to go ahead and turn over to our Zoom audience. Um, hi, John Sio. Uh, could you please uh, go ahead and unmute yourself? Uh, name, uh, please f uh, state your full name and your media organization before asking a question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hei Jun Seo. Um, I'm from Radio Free Asia. Uh, I have a quick question about North Korea. Um, you have tweeted recently that you met with ROK Deputy Foreign Minister Han sang and said that PSMX is providing tangible results in combating DPRK sanctions evasion. But could you provide further explanation on this? Because North Korea has been constantly violating the sanctions and still managed to develop their nuclear weapons. Um, and also on the same topic, what more could we do to bring North Korea back to the NPT and ultimately make them abandon its proliferating programs as concerns over North Korea's seventh nuclear test continues? Yeah, I think um, on the first question about the, the work that we do um, uh, uh, in, on the sanctions, I think the important thing to keep in mind is, 
you know, this is a this is an ongoing process in terms of trying to uh, the sanctions that that we have and the sanctions that some that's violated sometimes. Um, but it's an effort that we're committed to, and it's an effort that we need to keep doing. Um, and so we have been successful in many of the work that we do on these issues. But but the fact that we're not 100% should not be seen as seeing that it's not it's not working. Not only that, but we have a very good relationship with South Korea because of the ways in which we work with them on many issues. Uh, and this is also a way that we're strengthening our bilateral our relationship in terms of North Korean issues. So I think that there's, there's many factors that happen because of this relationship that we have and in many ways in which we're working with them on many different facets. In terms of bringing um, DPRK back into the NPT, um, you know, like I said, at this point, they won't, even, they won't even have a conversation. So I think before we can do that, we have to at least have a conversation with them. If they don't want to come back on their own and, and we're not able to really have a conversation with them on these issues, it does limit our abilities. That doesn't mean we're giving up. That doesn't mean we're not going to keep working on this. That doesn't mean we, we are not committed to denuclearization. It just means it's a challenge. Uh, and it remains a challenge, and we have to continue to find ways to deal with that um, and continue to push diplomacy uh, as a way in which we can do this and also continuing to work with our allies and a partner in the region. So. Any questions on the floor? Great. I'll turn back to our Zoom audience. Uh, Fez Paracha, could you please uh, unmute yourself, state your full name and your media organization before asking your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mawash. Uh, this is uh, Fais Paracha. I'm representing Pro-Pakistani, and it's the uh, largest uh, online publishing organization in Pakistan. So, um, Ambassador Jenkins, thank you very much. Uh, I understand it's been 50 years of uh, non-proliferation -pro treaty, and only five countries uh, are members. Uh, what are the chances of Pakistan and India joining NPT, or are they being uh, urged to join this uh, treaty? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, 50 years, we have over 180 countries who are party to it. We have five countries that are considered uh, nuclear weapon states because they were nuclear weapons possessor states at the time the treaty was uh, was um, negotiated in the 70s. Um, in terms of, uh, in, you know, we would, you know, we have a, a lot of exchanges with, with Pakistan and India in many respects, on many issues. Um, and so while it would be... Uh, great to see them a part of the of the treaty. Of course, this is a decision that they have to make in their sovereign capacity. Um, but we continue to work with them on many issues and have discussions and dialogue on many things, uh, including on nuclear issues. So this is a decision that they have to make. You know, and of course, we continue to espouse the value of the NPT, um, the importance of the NPT to the nuclear nonproliferation regime. Um, and we talk about our commitment to it and our, you know, all the all the obligations within the treaty. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's a decision that they will have to make, and we can just, you know, uh, continue to, to inform them about all the values of being a party to the NPT. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Melissa, could you hand the mic to the gentleman on the extreme right. Yep. So uh, please go ahead and state your name, sir, and your media organization, and then ask your question. Sure. Thank you. Again, it's Mike Wagon. I'm with I-24 News. You mentioned um, a hopeful regional approach, utilizing your allies and diplomacies to pull North Korea back into a conversation. The U.S. has not yet re-engaged with Syria, another problematic nuclear country, but regional allies are starting to re-engage with Syria again. Is there possibly a, a similar approach in, in that avenue? Um, I'm not sure what the thinking is on that particular issue. What I will say is it's, a, it's, it's an issue that is on our minds that is one of the things we have to talk about and think about uh, the next four weeks in terms of, you know, the language and what, what shows up um, on regarding the NPT final document. But, you know, we are engaging, of course, many countries in the region, and, you know, whether we take that approach, uh, we'll have to wait and see. Great. I'm going to go ahead and turn to our Zoom audience again. Amiya Tanaka, could you please unmute yourself, uh, state your name and your media organization, and ask the question, please. Amiya, go ahead. Thank you. 
think there's probably a microphone issue with Mia. Um, any other questions on the floor? Great. So we received a few pre-submitted questions. Um, under Secretary Jenkins, I'm going to go ahead and ask on behalf of those people. So this is a question from Asahi Shimbin from Japan. And uh, the question verbatim is, can you please clarify the U.S.'s position on the TPNW? And also, do you think anything related to the TPNW should be included in the final documents? Uh, yeah, this relates to the earlier question on the TPNW. I think I've pretty much answered that for the most part um, in terms of our concerns, uh, you know, our agreement with the underlying goal um, of, of the countries who are party to the TPNW, but just a difference in terms of, you know, how we see the process. I mean, the best way to say it is a difference in how we see the process for disarmament and the, and the fact that we have to take into account the security environment in which we're in. Um, but that we have reduced 88% of our nuclear stockpile. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, any additional questions on the floor? Any? Yes, ma'am, go ahead, please. Uh, state your name and your media organization. Hi, Kaori Yoshida from Nikkei again. I was wondering if you could elaborate. You mentioned that in the outcome document you wanted the challenges to be included. You mentioned the TPNW and the Middle East uh, nuclear free zone. Are there any other challenges that you would specifically like to see? Um, well, I think we, we talked about a, a number of other ones. You know, we talked Iran, we talked Syria, DPRK, like we mentioned. So these are these are challenges that are we're dealing with in terms of the NPT. And at a, at, at a time where it's the 50th anniversary, we have a chance to look at where we are, you know, and and what does the future bring, and how do we deal with these issues? So how they are reflected, in what way, in the final document is yet to be seen. What I, the, only thing I will, uh, the only thing I will say is we just want a final document, a consensus document that's reflective of, of the challenges that we have today. And of course, um, our, our wonderful negotiators in the next few weeks will figure out exactly how, that, how these things are reflected in the final document in what way and you know what might be in what might be out we just we just want a final document that's going to reaffirm the npt reaffirm the importance of it to the nuclear non-proliferation regime uh, and to show that we have been we are ready to tackle the next 50 years and that we have we have a, we have made some major achievements though we have some challenges and then the specifics within that in terms of how we deal with the challenges is yet to be discussed any other questions on the floor? I'm going to go ahead and turn to Alan Bulkari on Zoom. Uh, please, Alan, go ahead and state your name and your media organization before asking your question. Thank you so much for making the time for us. My name is Alan Bulkati. I'm a correspondent of uh, RIA Novosti News Agency. Uh, Madam Jenkins, I have two short questions, please. Uh, first, uh, what hinders the world to become fully free of nuclear weapons, on your opinion? And the second, please, uh, following up on the uh, statement uh, by President Biden, when the U.S. will resume the strategic dialogue with Russia to uh, discuss uh, the uh, successor agreement for New START Treaty? Thank you. Um, okay, so what's hindering us from becoming a uh, world free of nuclear weapons? Um, as I said, you know, we are making progress toward that. Um, the two largest nuclear weapon possessor states have been reducing their nuclear stockpiles. Um, this is a process that we've been doing for several years. We hope to have another a treaty that you reference, uh, the New START Treaty, which is going to be expiring in 2026. We want to get back to the table and start having dialogue with Russia um, as soon as they be begin to act in good faith regarding their unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Um, we don't have a specific time when that's going to happen, but that's the parameter in which we're looking at at this point, so we don't have more, anything more on that point. Um, but like I said, as, we, as I said about the TPNW, what holds us back is, you know, we have the desire, we have the, the, the vision, but we have to also deal with the security environment in which we're living in. Um, and we also have to look at the fact that we don't want um, 
you know, there's other countries that are actually developing more weapons. So we are in a position now where there's a desire, I know in the U.S. part and other, other parts to, to get to that goal of a world free without nuclear weapons, but it has to take into account the security environments in which we're in. And we have to keep working on it um, in that process and keep our eye on the ball, but recognize that we have to take into account current situations. Thank you, Ambassador Jenkins. Um, Pearl Matibe, go ahead and please unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, please also state your media organization. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon, um, Ambassador Jenkins. It's a pleasure to speak to you again. Uh, my question is regarding Africa and uh, uh, nuclear power. So I'm wondering, firstly, on Uganda, have you been following uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov's visit to Uganda? where he did meet with President Museveni and the discussion of possible, um, you know, collaboration with Russia. Uganda is asking for nuclear capability and to start, they're looking to get their first nu nuclear power plant. And also separately, Iran has reportedly applied to the BRICS to join China, Russia, South Africa, Brazil, and the other countries. Are you monitoring that situation for any possible uh, nuclear, uh, you know, development trends in that area. So I'm really interested to find out uh, your views on these two. Thanks. Well, could you also state your media organization kindly? Thank you. She's with uh, 98.7 South Africa. Okay, yeah. great. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I mean, we are following, um, you know, Russia's discussions about nuclear power around the world and in Africa, um, been following uh, also China's interest in promoting nuclear power. Um, the one thing I will say about that is, you know, we, we always have had uh, a little concern uh, about um, some of this work because one of the things that we have been promoting strongly in the U.S. is that nuclear power be, uh, be non-proliferation, um, abide by non-proliferation um, principles, safety, and security. Uh, and we've had concerns about countries that, um, that not with countries, but with uh, some of the uh, some of the work in nuclear power uh, that Russia and China has been has been uh, engaging in. Um, and so we've had concerns about that for 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 a while. And so it is concerning uh, to us when we are hearing about Russia and China engaging countries uh, on nuclear power issues because we also want to make sure that um, what's being done is going to be focusing and and be non-proliferation um, as as paramount and also safety and security so uh, just short I'll say we are following it um, you know of course these are decisions that countries make on their own as sovereign countries about who they want to engage with um, but like I said we are we are following it um, and we also are looking to engage countries as well on some of the things that we're interested in. So I think I'll just leave it at that. Great, thank you. Um, any additional questions on the floor? Great, so I, there is one more question that was pre-submitted um, by a journalist from Iran International. Her name is Samira Garay, and essentially uh -huh. it is, are there any concerns at the moment about any violation of the NPT committed by Iran? If yes, will USA take the matter to its hand uh, or will trust uh, IAEA to resolve the issue? Um, I think I'll just, just on this point, I'll just say, you know, we just, we have, we have expressed concerns about Iran uh, that's in our compliance report. Um, so we have had concerns about Iran and, and NPT um, obligations. Um, the IAEA, as you know, uh, performs a job of safety, security, safeguards. Um, they had a very important role in the JCPOA in terms of being able to be on the ground, to be able to do inspections, actually more intrusive inspections than they've had in any other country. Um, so the IAEA plays an important role in doing that uh, and would continue to, to play that role. Hopefully, you know, if we have another JCPOA, things to be discussed. There's still safeguard issues that are of concern uh, regarding uh, what's been happening in Iran. So yes, the, JC, uh, the IAEA plays an important role in that um, in terms of the future 
uh, and, and currently and what they do. So, yeah. Well, if there are no other questions uh, on the floor or on Zoom, I'm going to go ahead and conclude this meeting, uh, br this briefing, rather. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Um, on behalf of the New York Foreign Press Center, I'd like to thank Undersecretary Bonnie Jenkins for being with us. I uh, really appreciate you enlightening us. Uh, today's briefing was on the record. I will share a transcript with anyone, everyone who is participating today, and it will also be posted on our website, fpc.state.gov. Thank you all, and have a wonderful Thank day. Thank you, everyone.